Sorry, but be prepared for a fairly long story. Here goes. I was living in Hawaii and had to move to LA for work. Didn't know anyone and was fairly broke, and my job wasn't going to help with the moving expenses. So I had to resort to scouring Craigslist for a room to rent. After literally thousands of scams or weirdos, I finally find this amazing girl. She was funny, we had similar interests, and she even worked in the same field as me. She didn't have a place yet, but her and another girl were looking at several houses that required a third roommate. They were totally okay with doing all the work, seeing as how I was an ocean away. She called or Skyped with me about once a week, and sent me pictures of each house they looked at. All in all, she was pretty incredible. Fast forward three months, they found a huge and gorgeous house. Everything was settled. The two girls, Evan and Juliana, were moved in. And Evan, the original girl from the Craigslist, picked me and all of my stuff up at the airport. On the ride home, she starts telling me horror stories about her past roommates. Every single one had f***ed her over in some horrendous way. And she was terrified of being close to people after that. She said she wanted us to be the people who turned that around for her. And she wanted us to be like a little family. Instead of going directly to the house, we went to a nearby Starbucks where she chain smoked and told me about her stepdad who was in AA and how she'd briefly been attending NA meetings after a short bout with a painkiller addiction. She decided she wasn't a drug addict and didn't need it. Then, she admits that she's only known the other roommate for a month and a half. Red flags are starting to pop up all over the place. Why would an LA native need to find strangers to live with her on Craigslist? Why the oversharing about drugs in her family? Why had she never had a positive roommate experience? Push it all aside, giving this girl the benefit of the doubt. A few weeks go by in the house and all's well. I forget she ever seemed off and we start becoming closer and closer. She then takes me on a tour of LA for a day and proceeds to tell me her entire disturbing life story. When I say we'd gotten close, by no means were we close enough to make this appropriate. She tells me about her stepfather molesting her, getting sent to a mental hospital when she told on him because he's a doctor and she said she was criminally insane, then getting raped by a lesbian at the hospital and beaten by the guards, then attempting suicide, as well as her mother's severe narcotic addiction, her then ex-fiance having a psychotic break and trying to kill her, her struggles with chronic kidney illness that required many surgeries, her recent long-term boyfriend disappearing under mysterious circumstances, the horrific stories just went on and on and on. It sounded like something from a movie, and part of me questioned if it could all be possibly true. But again, I was giving her the benefit of the doubt. Things go fine for a while, and my doubts about her subside. And my food starts disappearing. I ask both girls about it privately, and Evan claims that the other girl, Juliana, had confessed to her that she was a compulsive overeater. Naturally, Juliana claims to be innocent. I side with Evan, and we start mildly bullying Juliana to try to get her to admit that she was stealing the food. And then dishes start piling up at the sink, and nobody is washing them except me. I ask both girls, and again, Evan swears on her life that it's Jules. Finally, Jules has had enough. It turns out she's been eating out every meal. We all had very different schedules. And Evan lied to my face about the dishes and food. When confronted, Evan starts crying and saying, How could you accuse me of such things? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. We ended up apologizing to her in the end. Finally, tension builds between the two girls due to many, many, many repeats of the situation. And one night, when I'm at work and they start fighting, Evan calls me saying that Juliana hit her and she's afraid for her life. I call Jules and tell her to find a new place to live. Juliana goes to stay with friends, and within a week, she moves out. Now this is where things get really, really weird. Evan moves out of the master bedroom and starts sleeping in the living room every single night. After I repeatedly request that she return to living in her own bedroom, she tearfully confesses that she's been on high-dose opiates this whole time. She's trying to wean herself off, but it makes her too weak to walk downstairs. Feeling sorry for her, 
I end up babysitting her for a few weeks while she withdraws. It was both terrifying and disgusting. I really wanted to help her out. During this time, I see her naked and realize that she has no scars from her quote-unquote repeated surgeries. Beyond that, she confides in me that she hasn't been working at all this entire time, but going out to score drugs and get high every single day. And now, she's flat broke. She apologizes for lying and saying over and over that she's a sick, sick addict and just needs help. I get her into AA and NA as soon as she's able to walk driving her to her daily meetings and holding her hand the entire time. My longtime boyfriend and her oldest friend move in with us a short while later to help with the bills. That's when it all goes from bad to unbearable. Evan goes to visit her mom one night and disappears for a week, returning very clearly high and claiming to be sober. She then starts going on many trips to visit friends in other states and is rarely home. When she is home, she babbles endlessly about how great sobriety is, and how she's finally healing, while clearly nodding out on opiates. I end up finding something suspicious on her computer, and she openly admits to me that she's been working as a call girl, bringing customers to our house. I tell her this has to stop, and she claims she already has. Around this time, she becomes very, very physically ill. Finally, I get a phone call from her after another absence. She's hysterical. She's, get this, six months pregnant. She didn't know because she was so high. The baby was severely malformed and there was no way of carrying it to term. I tried comforting her. Thinking that this trauma outweighed all the weird behaviors she's exhibited. She had the procedure and afterwards disappeared for almost a month. I thought at one point she was dead until she texted me asking if a cat was okay. When she returned, she proceeded to start eating all of our food, using all of our toiletries, sleeping on the couch, and smoking inside the house, which was not okay with us at all. She was very clearly on drugs again. At first, we tried to be nice about it, but she lied and lied and lied. Even going so far to say her room was haunted and the ghost made her sleep upstairs. Finally, my boyfriend snaps and yells at her. She calls the cops and claims he assaulted her. They didn't believe her, but the other roommate did. Then one night when I'm at home, she uses pity and sweet talking to convince my boyfriend that we should all be friends again. I told him it was a lie, and he didn't believe me. When I get home from work that same night, my room is trashed. I asked if he did it, and of course, he claimed he didn't. She'd been in there looking for cash or drugs, which I don't do. When I asked her about it, she looked me straight in the eyes and said, It was a ghost. After that, she started sending me insane emails, claiming that I'd been her best friend and betrayed her, accusing her of heinous crimes, and even convincing her that she was a drug addict as a form of a sick psychological torture. The emails get increasingly intense, becoming 10 to 20 pages about how she didn't feel safe in her own home and how I was the embodiment of pure evil, and that my only purpose in life was to torment her. In these emails, she claimed that she used drugs on rare occasion, and that I'd made everything about her problems up, and that I'd been verbally abusive about her abortion, and that we had repeatedly physically assaulted her. We were genuinely afraid for our safety, especially after the police showed up one day and took her in for a mysterious psychiatric hold. We never found out why she was carried out of the house, barefoot and handcuffed, by four LAPD officers. After that, we just tried to avoid her. But she got that other roommate evolved again. She went as far as to claim that she had pneumonia from the stress of living with us, and our constant abuse. The emails continued to escalate. At one point, she said that I had been a sister to her, until the evil spirit in me had forced me to abuse her. This was when I realized that her definition of abuse was a bit skewed, and all her stories about her childhood, exes, old roommates, and even Juliana had been complete fabrications. Of course, she didn't have scars from the surgeries. Everything she said was a lie, just to garner sympathy so she could take advantage of people. Now I realized this, of course, finally, and that she was completely mad. We found a new house, and the night before moving out, I hacked into her email, 
um, to find out she had been telling our landlord that we were heinous criminals. Telling her parents that she had been fired from a job because of me and needed money. All kinds of lies. Also, we came to find out that the guy who gotten her pregnant didn't mysteriously disappear. He ran away because they slept together once and she started stalking him. Obviously, everything she had ever said was a creepy little lie. Through moving out, the harassing emails and texts continued to the point that I have her blocked on both and seriously consider getting a restraining order. This was two years ago. Last month, we found out this girl who had claimed to have never been a drug addict, and that I made all of it up and died of an OD. She was evil. This wasn't a situation where nobody tried to help a sick person. Everyone around her tried to help her, and she manipulated and used every single one of them. I don't feel sad that she's gone. In fact, I still want to punch her in the face. TLDR, my roommate decided to be a drug-addicted, lying, stealing, sociopathic prostitute who semi-stalked me via email and text. Okay guys, yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've ever endured, and it all started with a phone call at about 7 a.m. I picked up my phone to see who was calling me so early, but since I didn't recognize the number, I just put it on silent and fell back asleep. When I woke up again three hours later, I saw that I had 12 missed calls and 8 new voicemails. Panic started to set in as I thought something horrible had happened to one of my family members. As I looked through all the missed numbers though, I realized that I didn't know who any of these people were. I thought that was really strange, since if something bad had happened to a family member, I should at least recognize one of these numbers. Things got weirder as I heard the first voicemail. Hi, I was just giving you a call about the house you have for sale. I saw the Craigslist ad and was hoping to figure out a time I could be given a walkthrough. Just give me a call back, thanks. I figured that was the wrong number and played the next one. Yeah, hi. I was calling about the house for sale on Craigslist. If you could, give me a call back. I'd really like to know some more stuff about those murders before I take a walkthrough. Thanks, and have a nice day. After hearing the second voicemail, I was really starting to wonder what the hell is going on here. The other six voicemails were all pretty much the same thing, inquiring about setting up a walkthrough and wanting to know about these quote-unquote murders. After I finished listening to the last one, I needed to find out what the fuck is going on. I called the last number to leave a voicemail, and a woman answered. When I asked her about the house she was calling about, she said there was an ad on Craigslist offering a house for dirt cheap, but it was only so cheap because the post said that a couple had been murdered inside the house. I asked her if she could text me the link, and she assured me that she would. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed and I saw her number pop up on its screen. I had no idea what I was in store for by clicking on that link, so when the web page opened, the coldest chill I've ever felt shot down my spine. I saw a picture of my house on Craigslist for sale. What made it worse was it was the picture that had been taken within the last week. You could see the pumpkin that I carved last weekend. And then I read the posting description. I have this sweet little home that I'm putting up for sale. It's located in this town. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the city. Enjoy all the seclusion and privacy that this house will bring you. My asking price is 25000 Disclosure, there is a reason I'm asking basically nothing for my house. The previous couple who lived there, a young man and a woman, were murdered in the house about a year ago. I figured it would get out in the open now so that I'm only contacted by people who are not bothered by this. Don't let this little mishap dissuade you though. The neighborhood is very safe. I promise. You can call, then they listed my name and number at any time, day or night. I never sleep and we can set a time to take a walkthrough of my house. I look forward to hearing from you soon, with a winky face. I felt like I'd been socked in the gut. What the fuck is going on? How did they know my number, my name? I immediately called my girlfriend over to see. I could see the horror set in on her face as she looked through the ad. I don't think I could feel any worse until she pointed out how our car was in the picture. We were in the house when someone took these pictures. I immediately called the police to figure out what the hell to do. They informed me that I should immediately contact Craigslist to remove the posting. Other than that, there was nothing really we could do at the moment. The only crime that had technically been committed 
would be trespassing, but since whoever took that picture wasn't on our property anymore, it really couldn't do anything else. I'm freaking the hell out. My girlfriend was on the phone with her mom in hysterics for most of the day yesterday. Today, we've just been on constant alert. Every sound we hear makes us jump. I think the worst part is, I know there's really nothing I can do. I feel so violated and so completely helpless. A couple of years ago, I responded to a Craigslist ad for a TV. I was in the market for a new one after mine broke, and unfortunately, I hadn't gotten the warranty for it. I searched on Craigslist because I figured that's where the best deals would be. People on Craigslist are generally just trying to get rid of stuff and will sell it somewhere else if they want more money. That's what I was thinking. So after searching for a while, I found a TV that looked good. It was 55 inches, relatively new, and was a good price. Not so cheap that it looked like a scam, but cheap enough that it was a really good deal. I saw that it was a new listing, and I decided to contact the seller immediately so that nobody else would get it before I had a chance to. The seller responded to me rather quickly, and I asked to look at the TV. I had the money and was prepared to buy it as long as it worked and everything, but my main problem was how I would bring it back to my place. My car was really small, and there was no way I was going to fit it in there. My buddy Danny had a truck that it would fit in, so I texted him and asked him if he would help me out. Meanwhile, I was told that I would be able to see the TV that day at 3 p.m., and I agreed to go see it. My hope was that Danny would be able to possibly meet me there with his truck, but a few minutes later, he wasn't responding to my text. I had to leave, and I drove to the location I was given to. It was about 15 minutes away from where I lived. I got to the neighborhood, which looked pretty average to me. It was a residential area that was a little bit out in the country, but not too much. Most houses were decently spread apart with larger yards and a decent amount of trees around. I arrived at the address and parked on the side of the street in front of it. It was a nice looking house with a long driveway. They had some nice decorations outside and a garden in the front yard. I texted the seller letting him know that I was there and he told me to come up to the front door. I got out of my car and walked up the driveway, then knocked on the front door. A man answered and said his name was Dave. Dave had gray hair and a gray goatee. He was maybe in his 50s or 60s. He told me he was selling the TV because his son gave him one, and he just wanted to get rid of this one now because he didn't need it. He then told me that he had some other people interested, so he hoped I would be able to buy it. After I saw the TV sitting in his living room and we turned it on, I told him yes I would like to buy it, but I wouldn't be able to drive it to my place. I explained how I texted my friend, and then I checked to see if Danny had gotten back to me. He had, but he said he wouldn't be able to help me until tonight. I asked the man if there was any chance he would be able to hold the TV for me just until 8 p.m. when I would be back. I was surprised, but the man agreed, but he said he wouldn't hold it any longer. I left and went back home, and when Danny came by with his truck that night, I texted Dave, the seller, and he said it was fine for me to come and buy the TV now. Danny and I drove back to Dave's place, now at nighttime. When we arrived at the neighborhood and made our way to the address, I got confused. Dave's house looked different. All of the lights were off, the yard decorations were gone, and even the flowers were gone. It looked as though it was a completely different place than a few hours earlier. Danny shut his engine off and had already gotten out of the truck. I got out and told him to wait because it just didn't look right. Danny was confused and asked why as he began to walk up the driveway. I told him how it looked like nobody lived there now and he did agree that it seemed creepy. I called Dave to let him know that I was there now, but after I called him, there was no answer. I texted him as well, but I couldn't get a response. We got back in the truck and sat in there waiting for about 15 minutes, but I didn't get any responses from Dave. I figured maybe he sold it to somebody else after all or something, and we decided we should just go back home. I was frustrated, and I was also really weirded out by the whole situation. That night, I was awoken in the middle of the night to my phone ringing. I picked it up and saw that Dave was calling me. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to answer it because I was really curious why he was calling me now. When I picked up, I could hear Dave's voice start to speak, but I couldn't make out anything that he was saying. He then began to laugh like a maniac and it really gave me the creeps. His laughing got louder and louder, and then he hung up. It took me a while to get back to sleep, but I was so creeped out by the whole situation that the next day, I drove all the way back to the neighborhood. I knocked on Dave's door, but nobody answered. The house still looked abandoned, so I went to the neighbor across the street and 
knocked on his door and asked him if he knew the guy who lived there. He told me that nobody currently lived in that house and hadn't for a couple of weeks. After learning this, I went back to Craigslist and found that the listing had been deleted. I also looked at my phone and tried to call and text Dave again, but my number was now blocked. Okay, so I've posted this on a sub before, and I was just thinking about creepy encounters I had. And it struck me that this one probably qualifies as kind of creepy. Hopefully I'm right. This happened about a year ago now. College student, and I was basically forced to move out on my own, which I didn't mind. That meant finding a new roommate, which can be daunting and a scary experience. I've had a few weird encounters, but I think this one takes the cake. I posted on Craigslist looking for a bedroom in a shared house or apartment for 300 or less. And on my ad I mentioned, please no phone calls, only text or email. Because I find being on the phone with someone I hadn't had a chance to size up a really uncomfortable situation. Just awkward, I guess. Anyway, I get a call from a dude who clearly didn't read the no calls part. Which I mention because this type of phone call was exactly the reason I don't like to talk to strangers on the phone. At first he was just pleasant and normal. Told me he had a room available and relevant information like that. We start to talk about when and where we'd like to meet. And he started going on tangents about random things. A combination of interested and deep conversation and too awkward to end a call when it starts to get kind of weird. So this call went on for two hours. I talked about the meaning of life and all kinds of weird shit. Honestly, this should have been the red flag. And I shouldn't have met with him. And of course, I also should have grown a pair and told him I needed to leave. So, he wants me to meet him at his place and show me the room. Since learned that you should really insist on meeting in a public place first. I get to his neighborhood. And it was run down on a level that made the ghetto I grew up in look nice. Saggy front porches, hot cracked concrete, sad people with old beat up Lincolns. You get the picture. His house blended right in. The yard was seriously overgrown and the front door didn't work. So I went around the back and just looked at the guy standing in the doorway. Seeing the kitchen behind him was enough to make me realize that I really just wanted to leave. No way in hell. The guy in the doorway was a man with a sort of clown-style afro. He was leaning on a cane on his right side. His eyes looked crazy, and the house smelled musty from ten feet away. Again, I'm a coward, so instead of trusting my gut, I go inside this house, and I'm polite, thinking, it's okay, it'll be over in twenty minutes, and then I can get the f*** out. I don't know what made me think this man, who had a two-hour conversation with me on the phone about life and philosophy, would let me get away that easily. He took me up a flight of creaky steps into a small bedroom with no door and a mattress on the floor. I thought, no way in hell would I live with a 40-something year old man, and I was a 19 and a female, with no door on my bedroom. But it was a moot point because my mind was made up before I even saw the room. I wouldn't have lived there for free, let alone $200 a month. Things got weird. He tried to hold me hostage with conversation again. I think he was lonely. He talked about how some of his family were millionaires. He might have been delusional. The whole story seemed made up. He told me about an 18 year old girl that has also checked out the room and tried to f him. And told me about how his mom hated white people. He was black and I was white. And it sounded like he sympathized with her. Obviously that made me even more uncomfortable. Eventually I was able to find a break in the conversation plucked up the courage to make up an excuse and leave. I was never so happy to leave a place in my life. I don't know that he was necessarily a rapist or anything like that, but he really gave me the f***ing creeps. I used to work as an event coordinator at the Swan and Dolphin Resort slash Convention Center. Sometimes we'd have to get there at really early hours of the day before the union laborers showed up. This was to get everything ready and set up for special events and stuff like that. One day, one of my managers had cut my hours due to a budget decline in the company. 
This resulted in me not making as much money as I used to, which caused me to fall behind on rent. Therefore, I had to start making some money until I could either get more hours or find a new job. Eventually, I began to sell some items on sites like Craigslist and eBay, which added to my income. It wasn't much, but it was enough to financially support myself through this time. At the time, I was in the process of selling a specific type of radio from the 40s that was worth a pretty penny. It was my grandpa's radio, and I guess it somehow got passed on to me after he died. I've gotten several offers for it, but the majority of them were people trying to lowball me for prices too small. At one point, however, I get a message from a guy who seemed really interested in it who was willing to offer me $500 for it, which was more than the listed price. I of course accepted the offer, and he then told me that he could come after 5 after he got off work. This was actually better for me, as I'd be out until 4. Anyway, 5pm rolls around, and a few minutes after, I get a knock at the door and open it. Standing at my doorstep is an older looking man, maybe late 50s, tall, with a long grey beard. To describe him a little better, he looked like a biker you'd commonly see in country movies. In a very deep and raspy voice, he says, Uh, hey there, I'm here for that radio. I happily let him in and show him the radio sitting on the kitchen table and even got him a snack. Oddly enough, he immediately begins inspecting the condition of it and even went as far as checking the inside. After what felt like forever, he puts it down and says he'd do it for 300 as the condition wasn't the best. Needless to say, of course, that $500 deal was out the window. He then stares at me with this intimidating look where I felt like I didn't have a choice. In the end, I had to agree and did the deal with him right then. Mind you, I'm a petite 5 foot 7 girl, so I wasn't going to try and argue with someone like him. He gives me the money, puts the radio in his car, thanks me, and drives off. I wasn't sure why, but something about him just gave off a negative vibe which made me glad he was gone. The rest of the night was normal, where I had been watching a movie in my bed when my phone rang. The call was coming from an unknown number, but the area code was the same. Without thinking much of it, I pick up and immediately recognize the voice on the other end. It was the man from earlier calling me to thank me. What he said, however, will forever be burned into the back of my mind. Hey Sally, uh, look, thank you so much for your hospitality and kindness. If I'm being completely honest with you, I was planning to kill you with a knife I had in my back pocket the second I walked into your house. But you, you were just so kind, I, I just couldn't pull myself to do it. Take care now. Right then, my mouth draped open as humanly possible with all these thoughts racing through my mind. If I'm being honest with you, I wasn't sure what to do other than to process as to what I just heard. I would have called the police, but I later found out that the number he was using was fake from an app. That basically meant that even if police were to track the number, it wouldn't lead to him. After that, I removed the listing from Craigslist and never touched the site again. As scary as this was, I never received any updates on his identity or if he's in jail or not. There are seriously some crazy people out in the world who are willing to do anything to you. I emphasize that you please be careful when selling or buying something from sites like Craigslist. You never know who's out there and what they're capable of. This happened when I was in my mid-twenties back in 2012 when I was living in Sarasota, Florida. I had just graduated from college and had gotten a job in IT as a software engineer at a really good company. 
Because of this job, I was able to move out of my parents' house and get an apartment. It wasn't big, but it was spacious enough where I could store most of my stuff. When moving out, odds are you'd probably have a few items left over that you no longer needed or wanted. Well, I had the same situation and had some things I didn't need that I put up for sale on Craigslist. At the time, Craigslist was booming in popularity where people were buying and selling left and right. One of the items I had listed was this large tote I had used back when I played sports. It was in pretty good condition and I figured I'd snag a deal on it since sports were popular in my town. I'd say within a day, I had gotten a message from someone nearby interested in the tote. He seemed nice, didn't live too far, and was willing to pay more than what I was listing it for. Being so close to me, he'd offered to just meet me at my apartment which would make for a smoother transaction. I'll be honest, I was a little uncomfortable knowing that him, a complete stranger, would know where I lived. That being said, I brushed it off and told him I'd do it. Later that night, I hear a knock at the door and was greeted to a man who looked to be in his mid-thirties with this Swedish accent. He immediately goes to hug me, telling me that it was a nice way of saying hello in Sweden. Being a gay guy, I didn't really mind it and thought it was a kind gesture. He hugs me for a good 10 seconds before letting go and asking me for the tote. I gladly give it to him and he then proceeds to pull out a $100 bill and hands it to me, making sure our hands touched. It was a little uncomfortable, but I dismissed it as something people always did in Sweden. He thanks me, hugs me again, and walks down the hallway to the exit. Now let's fast forward till about two days later. I happened to be sick on this day and had called off work to rest. As I'm taking a nap in my room, I hear a heavy knocking on my door which abruptly awoke me. I opened the door and was greeted to two police officers and the property manager. Confused, I asked what was going on to which they then asked if I knew this person. The property manager showed me a photo of a man on his phone who just so happened to be the guy I had sold the tote to. I tell them yes and explain that I had sold him a bag, but that was all I ever knew about him. They take down my name, my description of him, and what he ever said to me or did to me. Whenever I asked why they needed that information, they informed me that they couldn't tell me as of now. That being said, they leave and it wasn't until a few days later where I had finally gotten my answer. Turns out... The man I had sold the bag to had been wanted for owning 23 terabytes of CP. To put that in perspective, a single terabyte is equivalent to a thousand gigabytes. This meant that he had about 13,000 hours of content downloaded. When I was told this, I was beyond disgusted, knowing I was talking to a predator, a wanted predator in my home. The tote I had sold him was to keep certain documents that contained information on how to cover his tracks. Obviously, this plan never went through as he did end up getting caught in the end. I was interviewed for about a week by police before my complete shock slowly got back to normal. After that, I deleted my entire Craigslist account and decided to not sell anything else. Anyway... That's my story, and I hope you can take this as a learning opportunity to never trust people online.